Welcome to some very famous people you've never really heard of. Bite-sized biographies of the famous, the infamous, and the quirky in less than an hour. My name is Philip D. Gibbons, and there is more information about me, this podcast, and a bibliography at someveryfamouspeople.com. There are also photographs of many of the individuals and items mentioned in this podcast. At the conclusion of Part 1, there will be additional suggestions concerning further information about today's subject, Benedict Arnold. Now let's get started with our story, Benedict Arnold. Especially for a generation of 20th century American school children, the name is synonymous with traitor. During the American Revolution, Arnold famously plotted to betray the American fortress at West Point, New York, and provided the British with important intelligence about strategy and troop deployments. The loss of West Point would have been catastrophic to the American cause, allowing the British to seize control of the Hudson River and militarily divide the colonies. That Arnold was willing to do this for a substantial sum of money only adds to his disgrace, but it might also provide clues to his motivation and outlook at the time. Not as well known as his subsequent treachery, Benedict Arnold initially fought bravely and occasionally very successfully in the Revolution, but also frequently bickered with commanding officers over recognition, promotion, and expenses. His marriage to Philadelphia socialite and British sympathizer Margaret Peggy Shippen also greatly influenced and enabled his subsequent behavior. Shippen was a conduit to her friend, Major John Andre, Arnold's subsequent contact within the British military. Arnold's resentment over his dysfunctional military career, the hostility he encountered from his American colleagues that had resulted in his court-martial over expenses, and his inability to underwrite the lavish lifestyle appropriate to his newly gained social status, all contributed to the events that immortalized Arnold as one of the most reviled figures in American history. Benedict Arnold was born in Norwich, Connecticut on January 14, 1741. Arnold was one in a succession of Benedict Arnolds, including his father and great-grandfather, the first governor of the colony of Rhode Island. Although the Arnolds were at one time quite prosperous, Benedict's father was unable to inherit much wealth, already squandered by his father, forcing his heir to earn his own way in the world. Arnold's father did this by emigrating to Norwich, where he became involved in a prosperous maritime operation operated by one Absalom King. Arnold worked in King's nautical shop and helped sail King's ships to the Caribbean and across Long Island Sound. On a transatlantic voyage in 1732, King died at sea, and within a year, the opportunistic Benedict Arnold III had married King's wealthy widow and taken control of the business. Hannah Waterman King Arnold would give birth to 11 children in her lifetime. Only two would survive to adulthood, including her second son with Benedict Arnold III. This would be the most famous and infamous of the Arnolds. Initially, things were economically good for the Arnold family. Captain Arnold's business thrived, and he and his pious wife were respected as pillars of the community. Benedict Arnold was enrolled in a local grammar school and eventually at the Canterbury School, a stepping stone to Yale and accessed only by the wealthy. But poor management and alcoholism would get the better of Captain Arnold. His business would eventually go bankrupt, forcing Benedict's removal from prep school. At the age of 13, Benedict was forced to pursue the career path of many teenagers in the American colonies when he went to work as an apprentice. Through his mother's family connections, Arnold trained as an apothecary in a relative's prosperous Norwich shop. This relative, Dr. Daniel Lathrop, brought the teenager into his impressive riverfront mansion. Arnold's parents signing official articles of apprenticeship that indentured the boy until the age of 21. This was another common practice of the day, especially in cases where a family was threatened by the debt now confronting Arnold's father. Having lost all of her own children to disease, Daniel Lathrop's wife, Jerusha, treated Arnold as her own son and for several years was exposed to the genteel and proper existence within the Lathrop business and home. However, when the conflict known as the French and Indian War broke out in 1754, 
It instilled within Arnold a restlessness to join the military effort against what was nationally perceived as a barbarian attack. Initially, with his master's permission, the 16-year-old Arnold would set out in 1757 to the Champlain Valley in upstate New York with an expedition of Norwich residents, intent on joining forces repelling Indian attacks coordinated by the French. This venture would conclude quickly, the unit returning to Connecticut without seeing any action. But the experience would prompt Benedict to leave home for subsequent military adventures without Lathrop's permission. Although the doctor legally hauled him back on several occasions, Arnold would eventually succeed in permanently joining the New York militia in 1759. Unfortunately, hearing that his mother was gravely ill, he deserted and made it back to his mother's bedside in time for her death on August 15, 1759. His willingness to flout the law out of devotion to his mother, his handling of her funeral and his attempts to provide for his only sibling, his sister Hannah, endeared him to the locals, especially his adoptive parent, Jerusha Lathrop. Captain Arnold, now a hopeless alcoholic, was destitute, and Mrs. Lathrop provided Arnold money and support. Dr. Lathrop literally kept Arnold's father out of debtor's prison, assuming various debts. Benedict Arnold's father finally died in January of 1762. By then he was mocked as the town drunk, a dissent that instilled in his son an aversion to alcohol and a hostility to the town of Norwich itself. Upon his father's death, Dr. Lathrop gifted Benedict Arnold his father's home, free and clear, gave him a small fortune to start a trading business after Arnold expressed a desire to strike out on his own, and letters of introduction to be used in the young man's intended destination, New Haven. The ambitious and shrewd Arnold opened a shop in the thriving seaport town and stocked it with the latest luxuries from England, brought personally by the owner. He marketed himself as Dr. Arnold from London, which only added to his venture's prestige. Arnold also seems to have been quite domineering in his dealings with his sister, Hannah. He sold the family home in Norwich, forcing her to move to New Haven, where she would work within his business. He was also quite hostile to any potential suitors, and despite his sister's eligibility, she would never marry, remaining devoted to her brother despite subsequent events. Arnold used the proceeds from the sale of the family home to finance the purchase of a merchant ship, and by the age of 25 was prosperously operating three such vessels. Technically, with stricter regulation being imposed by the British Empire, Arnold would be part of a class of maritime businessmen who shaded the law and resorted to what would be officially deemed smuggling. Illegal trade with French, Spanish, and even Dutch outposts in the Caribbean provided such products as sugar and molasses, with merchants like Benedict Arnold circumventing the hefty British tax imposed on such products obtained through legal means. In fact, the British government's attempts to clamp down on these practices and wealthy British trading interests intent on imposing a monopoly on such markets would be a major cause of the American Revolution. Due to his profession, Benedict Arnold would be thrust into the center of the conflict over stricter British government attempts to collect taxes and duties owed by merchants like himself. He responded by joining the Sons of Liberty, a large organized group that was involved in rowdy and violent protests throughout the American colonies. The Sons of Liberty responded forcefully to a new British tax on specially stamped paper produced in Britain that was required for most printed material. The ensuing demonstration so vehement that the British Parliament actually backed down and repealed the Stamp Act in 1766. Part of the American hostility to this and other taxes was a worsening of the economy, with merchants relying on debt to buy goods on credit, only to have their customers renege based on their lack of prosperity during the economic recession of the era. Arnold himself would be sued by creditors during this time period and would barely keep his enterprise running. Despite this external conflict, Arnold was able to court and marry a very attractive, well-connected 22-year-old named Margaret Mansfield, the daughter of a local prosperous merchant and fellow Freemason. Although the marriage would quickly produce three sons, Arnold's wife would devolve into a gloomy, uncommunicative individual who never responded to Arnold's letters from sea. Arnold weathered his economic peaks and valleys to eventually construct a magnificent home on a three-acre plot that was among the most impressive in New Haven. 
Predictably, Benedict Arnold was galvanized by such incidents as the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party. He took an active role in organizing the state militia that formed as a response to British military presence and incursions, especially in New England. By late 1774, this militia would be commanded by members of the Sons of Liberty and would total over 6,000 men in a state that had a population of 100,000. On April 19, 1775, inevitable violence between occupying British soldiers and American rebels broke out at Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts. Upon hearing of the conflict, Benedict Arnold immediately assembled over 60 militia members in New Haven and vowed to march to Massachusetts to aid the rebellion. On the way, he encountered other militia members and leaders who were long on enthusiasm and short of supplies, especially artillery that would be crucial to any attempt to bottle up British troops headquartered in Boston. Arnold, who was familiar with the territory surrounding New York and New England, hit upon the idea of seizing the British installation at Fort Ticonderoga in upstate New York and had little trouble in persuading the Massachusetts Committee of Safety to finance a mission to seize the fort. Vermonters, under the command of Ethan Allen, had the same idea, and when the rough-edged Green Mountain Boys were confronted by Arnold with orders from Boston, they bristled, especially at the sight of the out-of-towner, clothed in a perfectly tailored scarlet uniform. Eventually, an agreement was worked out in which command was divvied up between Allen and Arnold. The garrison at Fort Ticonderoga was minimal and would not expect an attack, not even aware of the outbreak of war in Boston. Although Fort Ticonderoga was captured without a single casualty, the plan to immediately transport artillery was hindered by the Green Mountain Boys, who were more intent on consuming the British liquor supplies and looting private property. Arnold would spend the next few months dealing with infighting fomented by Allen's surrogates, intent on taking credit for the success at Ticonderoga and Crown Point, and confusion from the various political entities attempting to impose some organization on the practically spontaneous rebellion. Arnold was intent on aggressively invading Canada before the British could reinforce the area and begin their own attack, but after his command was undermined and his expense reimbursement requests ignored, he returned to Connecticut in June of 1775. News of his wife's sudden death reached Arnold as he returned home, a development that must have added to his gloom. Only weeks later, with his sister running his household and what remained of his business, Arnold set out for Cambridge, Massachusetts. Once there, he arranged a meeting with George Washington, the newly appointed commander of the Continental Army, and sketched out his strategy of a specific invasion of Quebec with an emphasis on local support from a French-Canadian populace hostile to British rule. He also wished to invade the province from the north via the wilderness region of Maine, a daring but also challenging plan. Washington endorsed this idea and also got agreement from Philip Schuyler, the general now officially assigned to leading the American effort in the Lake Champlain region. With approximately a thousand men, Arnold set out in early September. Because of challenging logistics through swamps and inhospitable terrain and waterways, did not even reach Quebec until late October. Storms, illness, and lack of adequate supplies, as well as the desertion of a third of his force, already threatened the expedition. But Arnold pressed on, reaching his intended target, the British fortress at Quebec City. He intended to leak up with Richard Montgomery, who would replace Schuyler as the commander of the American unit that was also invading Canada via Lake Champlain and Montreal. Montgomery was an Irish former British army officer who had married a wealthy relative of Philip Schuyler. He was initially appointed second in command, but when Schuyler's declining health forced him to abandon the invasion of Canada, Montgomery took over. A gifted, charismatic commander who generated confidence among his soldiers, Montgomery had already captured Montreal and provided Arnold's under-equipped unit with clothing and supplies. But his force only numbered about 300 men and combined with Arnold's 600, was far below the thousands that had initially accompanied the northern invasion. Nevertheless, Montgomery and Arnold spent December planning the inevitable storming of the city, a siege impossible against superior British artillery, and December 31st the end of the enlistment period of many of Arnold's militiamen. They resolved to attack central Quebec City by scaling the walls on the first cloudy night towards the end of the month. 
perhaps not coincidentally, an attack was ordered on the snowy night of December 30th to take place in the early morning hours of the 31st. Rockets signaled the 4 a.m. attack by the divided American column, but these rockets also alerted the British, who, tipped off by an American deserter, were expecting the attack. Montgomery and several of his officers were killed after literally sawing through a log barricade and attempting to storm a heavily fortified blockhouse. Arnold was wounded in the leg in a similar frontal assault, the attack eventually dissipating into an utter failure, with dozens killed and hundreds ultimately taken prisoner. What was left of the American invasion force, including the wounded Arnold, retreated and waited for reinforcements and supplies. An inconsequential siege continued through the winter and spring of 1776, but it was ended by the eventual arrival of thousands of British troops who promptly chased the Americans and Arnold out of Quebec. The invasion ultimately a dismal failure. Similar massive British military forces successfully invaded New York City, the British believing that a coordinated attack of their own would split the colonies and ultimately end the rebellion. British troops in Quebec attempted to capture American forts at Ticonderoga and Crown Point, an invasion that Arnold anticipated. Now reporting to Schuyler and his newly appointed second-in-command Horatio Gates, Arnold spent the summer constructing a fleet to oppose the requisite naval transport of British ships across Lake Champlain. Arnold's hope was to delay the British advance and force the attackers to halt their invasion and take up winter quarters without making much progress. Although a British naval expedition under the command of Guy Carleton, the British Governor General of North America, and Arnold's opponent at Quebec City succeeded in destroying most of Arnold's hastily constructed fleet at the Battle of Valcour Island on Lake Champlain on October 11, 1776, ultimately this invasion stalled and was forced to halt, delaying any further British incursion until the spring of 1777. Arnold's strategy had prevented the British from their overall goal of linking with an army heading north from New York City and bisecting the American colonies, a potentially fatal blow to the revolution. By the winter of 1776, Benedict Arnold had already incurred the enmity of most of the politicians and military figures involved in the colonial effort. While he considered himself a soldier and a patriot above the backroom politicking of the Continental Congress, his enemies continually attempted to undermine his reputation. Throughout 1776, he defended himself against charges and even a court-martial concerning theft of property during the invasion of Quebec. In December, Arnold, en route to Philadelphia, the seat of the Continental Congress, met with George Washington in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Washington's small army had been driven initially out of New York and then New Jersey and was now fighting for survival, only the season stopping the British from mopping up the remainder of Washington's troops. Intent on speaking directly to the American hierarchy in Philadelphia and possibly resigning his position, Arnold acceded to Washington's request to assume command of the effort to stop another British invasion in New England, the British having recently successfully captured Newport, Rhode Island. Arnold postponed his confrontation in Philadelphia and proceeded to his hometown of New Haven. Here he was greeted as a hero, one of the few bright lights during the darkest days of the American Revolution. Despite the tactical failures at Quebec and on Lake Champlain, Arnold was perceived as one of the few American military leaders who had attacked and even succeeded in impeding the British military. When Arnold reviewed the situation in Rhode Island, he decided to postpone the expected assault on Newport that would expel the British from this seaport town. Counseled by Washington not to engage in battle unless he was completely positive, Arnold found the local state militia ill-equipped and completely unprepared for such a formidable task. Instead, he whiled away the rest of the winter attending high society events in Boston and attempting to court a 16-year-old debutante named Elizabeth Betsy Deblois. His failure to hook up with Betsy paled in comparison to the slight he received in February of 1777, when he learned that five other men had been promoted to the rank of major general by the Continental Congress, a slap in the face not only to him but also to Washington, who learned of the action from the media of the day, printed newspapers. In disgust, Arnold returned home to New Haven, where in late April, upon hearing of an impending British attack on the main American armory at Danbury, he successfully helped lead local militia in a successful repulse of the attack. Having two horses shot out from under him, 
and having inflicted heavy casualties on the retreating redcoats, Arnold finally received his promotion. Former military colleagues of Arnold persisted in slighting both his military capability as well as his morality. One went so far as to publish a handbill containing the provocative allegation that money is this man's god, and to get enough of it, he would sacrifice his country. Again, Arnold felt obliged to travel to Philadelphia and to confront the members of the Continental Congress in person. Much of the controversy concerning Arnold centered around expenses incurred during the invasion of Quebec. While he would successfully restore his good name, the Congress did nothing to restore his seniority among the Army's general staff, a development that prompted Arnold to submit his resignation on July 11, 1777. Only days before, Washington became aware of a new British invasion in the Hudson Valley, this time commanded not by the plotting, deliberate Governor Carleton, but by the flamboyant John Burgoyne. Understanding that the current commanders of the colonial forces in the area, Philip Schuyler and Horatio Gates, having already surrendered Fort Ticonderoga without firing a shot, would be greatly aided by the addition of the aggressive and daring Arnold, Washington decided to involve him in the defense of the region. He implored Congress to reject Arnold's resignation letter and to order him to accept Washington's request to eventually assign him to the Hudson Valley effort. Congress agreed but refused to restore Arnold's seniority for a second time. By the time he became aware of the slight, Arnold was heartened enough by Washington's confidence to forget about it for the moment and respond to the renewed British threat to upstate New York. Arnold immediately improved the situation by repelling a British and Mohawk column, threatening to link up with Burgoyne via Fort Stanwix and the Mohawk Valley. While some dubious historical accounts describe Arnold as using trickery to deceive native troops accompanying the British into deserting in the face of what they believed to be an impending massive attack, Arnold's efforts did result in the retreat of this force all the way to its home base on Lake Ontario. This positive development coincided with a battle at Bennington, Vermont, on August 16, 1777, in which troops sent by Burgoyne to link up with loyalists in New Hampshire were set upon by local militia and completely destroyed, with a thousand killed or captured. Suddenly, Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne, as he was known in London society, was down to 5,000 men and critically short of supplies. He faced the prospect of either admitting failure and retreating back towards Canada or pressing on in an effort to find suitable winter quarters closer to British territory near New York City. Burgoyne decided to advance, also making the fateful decision to abandon recently captured outposts along his chain of supply. He would eventually be forced to fight his way out of his now encircled position, outnumbered by more than two to one by American soldiers and militia from New York, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Vermont. After returning from his successful Mohawk Valley campaign, Benedict Arnold became embroiled in the ongoing political struggle between Generals Philip Schuyler and Horatio Gates. The ambitious Gates was perpetually undermining Schuyler, ultimately successful in getting the Continental Congress to promote him into Schuyler's command after the latter's sluggish efforts concerning the abandonment of Fort Ticonderoga. Arnold and Gates were initially civil, but this relationship quickly deteriorated, with Gates possibly feeling threatened by his volatile and strong-willed subordinate. Arnold did little to help the situation, appointing some of Schuyler's former staff to his own staff and open a front to Gates. While this intrigue festered, the American force waited for the inevitable confrontation with Burgoyne's increasingly desperate army. The military turning point of the American Revolution, known as the Battle of Saratoga, was actually a succession of two battles that took place in the vicinity of Saratoga, New York. Expecting that the British would continue their march southwards towards Albany, Gates's army selected a strategic position on an elevated position known as the Bemis Heights. Understanding that attacking the entrenched American position there would be be disadvantageous, Burgoyne attempted a flanking maneuver that resulted in the Battle of Freeman's Farm. Although he won a tactical victory by ultimately forcing an American retreat from the field of battle, Burgoyne suffered major casualties and was unable to follow up on this success. While General Gates remained safely from the front lines in his tent, Benedict Arnold was repeatedly visible in the field of battle, helping to halt the British attack. 
As night fell, Arnold wished to aggressively pursue the British, who seemed on the verge of collapse. He was forbidden to do so by Gates, an order that infuriated Arnold and brought the hostility between the two generals into the open. In both heated personal argument and written communique, Arnold expressed anger at what he felt were both deliberate attempts to minimize his role and slight him personally. The situation became so intense that Gates eventually demoted him entirely. While the American general staff bickered, the British situation worsened. Canadians accompanying the invasion began to desert in large numbers after the first battle. Burgoyne's hope that help would come in the form of troops from Sir Henry Clinton in New York City diminished, and the British general realized that his only options were disgraceful retreat or an advance via a successful attack on the American army in his path. On October 7, 1777, Burgoyne attempted to probe the American lines at Bemis Heights with several thousand troops, hoping again to outflank American lines. As the sound of the fighting reached Arnold in his tent in the vicinity of General Gates, again comfortably headquartered out of harm's way, the demoted general could not stand staying out of battle and suddenly climbed on his horse and headed rapidly into the conflict. Although Gates sent an aide to personally order Benedict Arnold off of the battlefield, this aide would never catch up with him. Arnold spent the rest of the day leading several counterattacks, so visible at the head of several American assaults that it seemed miraculous that he was not killed. Upon successfully seizing British fortifications after hand-to-hand -hand combat, Arnold was inevitably wounded in the same leg injured previously in Quebec, his dead horse compounding wounds by falling on top of him. With the British Army in full retreat, Arnold was carried behind the lines on a litter. Burgoyne's 1,000 casualties underlined the overwhelming 3-to-1 manpower disadvantage he now faced. Reluctantly, after meeting with whatever general staff had not been killed, he came to the unavoidable decision to surrender, which occurred officially on October 17th. This stunning defeat of a battle-tested traditional British army at the hands of what was considered an undisciplined, under-equipped rabble sent shockwaves throughout Europe. The victory induced the French court of Louis XVI to enter into serious negotiations to provide the colonial upstarts military and financial aid, a development that eventually proved pivotal. It also indicated to the British military and government that American troops could function as a credible fighting force worthy of their respect. Personally, it also meant disgrace for John Burgoyne, who never received another field command. Despite his loss of military credibility, the aristocratic Burgoyne remained prominent in both British politics and as a playwright. Upon his death in 1792, he was buried in Westminster Abbey. Benedict Arnold not only had to deal with a musket ball wound that had severely injured his leg, he remained officially thankless, marginalized in Horatio Gates' official report to the Continental Congress. Gates hogged most of the glory from the victory and became a national hero, while Arnold remained bedridden for months. Typically, such a wound would have prompted amputation, but Arnold refused to allow this procedure. Although the limb healed, it would be permanently two inches shorter than his other leg, an impactful development for the vigorous general. During his convalescence, Arnold seemed to transform from an enthusiastic, motivated soldier into an embittered skeptic. Practically, his injury prevented an active role on the battlefield, and after the British withdrew from their occupation of Philadelphia, Washington fatefully appointed Arnold as the city's military governor in June of 1778. Philadelphia was abandoned by the British after the misguided occupation by General Howe in September of 1777. Instead of relieving Burgoyne in upstate New York, Howe reasoned that occupying the American capital and hounding Washington's bedraggled army, which would famously spend the winter at Valley Forge, was a more effective blow to the colonial rebellion. But Howe's short-sighted plan did not account for the prospect of occupying a city, after most of its merchants and the Continental Congress fled, and that the Colonials would continue to fight after their capital was captured. Food and other provisions were scarce, and Howe returned to New York in June of 1778. With Arnold unable to physically perform on the battlefield, Washington reasoned that a stationary post in Philadelphia would be a worthy assignment. <laughs> Thank you for listening to part one of this podcast about Benedict Arnold. 
Much of the information for this effort came from the books Benedict Arnold, Patriot and Traitor by Willard Stern Randall, The Traitor and the Spy by James Flexner, and Treacherous Beauty, Peggy Shippen, the woman behind Benedict Arnold's plot to betray America. There are also additional photographs, bibliographical and musical information at someveryfamouspeople.com, as well as sketches by John Andre. If you have enjoyed this presentation, please like us at our Facebook page, Some Very Famous People, and follow us on Twitter at Philip D. Gibbons. Also rate us on iTunes, and if you have the time, leave a brief review. A link is provided at the website.